Okay, hello everyone and welcome to tonight's um, virtual museum lecture. Welcome again everyone uh, to the autumn 2022 season we presented by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. I know we are so pleased to be back this season. Um, to begin, let's begin with a uh, an Indigenous uh, land acknowledgement. Our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the Indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia, and we would like to honor the centuries of Indigenous people that have stopped, that um, who have walked on Turtle Island before us. Uh, my name is Sarah Nixon, public programmer at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center, and I am so thrilled to be here. I would like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to everyone this evening joining us from your from your screens, whether you are joining live or maybe you're tuning in after the fact, welcome. Um, and a special welcome to any audience members who are out there new to the series. Thank you for joining us. We hope that these lectures provide a little bit of historical joy and spark imagination and exploration in our city's rich history. There are so many ways to join in the historical fun and to get your local history fix. You can view all past lectures on our YouTube channel playlist and you can listen to lecture audio on our podcast VMLS via podcast, which you can find anywhere you get your podcasts under STC Museum Podcasts. Oh, here we go. Here's uh, the shot I wanted of our, uh, our podcast page. <laughs> As always, uh, please feel free to um, make use of the chat box to ask questions or send comments. We will moderate these during and at the end of the presentation. And there's a bit of a delay in broadcasting. So if we miss your question, I will definitely get to it at the end of, uh, of the presentation. We so appreciate you joining the lecture series and we would equally appreciate a donation in support of our programming. Your donation helps us to continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming that you have come to expect from us. We really appreciate any donation that you are able to make. You can give us a call at 905 9848880 or uh, visit the donation portal at our active STC page where you can also make a donation. Your donations do make a difference. So thank you. Now, uh, before I hand it over to our very knowledgeable guest speaker, I would like to share our upcoming lectures this season. On October 18th, we will welcome special guest Paul Miller to speak about the history and perhaps the future of the Queenston, um, the Queenston Street neighborhood. On November 1st, we will welcome a special guest and historian, Dr. Jonathan Vance, to discuss his research into corporate memorials with a lecture titled, Our Gallant Employees, Corporate Commemoration in Post-War Canada. Oh, is it not to work? There we go. On November 15th, Curator Kathleen Powell will deliver a lecture about the interwar period in St. Catharines titled In the Public Interest, Public Works in St. Catharines Between the World Wars. On November 29th, special guest, local historian and chair of the city's Heritage Committee, Brian Nari, will return to the series to give a talk about early settlement in St. Catharines. As you may remember, Brian loves a good title and offers this as the title to his lecture, Ponderous Frost Miners and Jaded Farm Horses, or Early St. Catharines Before the First Welland Canal. And finally, 
We are also happy to welcome back Dr. Kimberly Monk on December 13th to provide an update on her work at the Shikluna Shipyard Dig. After two long years away from the site, Dr. Monk will be back on the, was on the back or was returned to the dig site this past summer. And we are so looking forward to welcoming her back to hear more about this fascinating history. Okay. Finally, now I am so happy to welcome tonight's special guest lecturer and esteemed local historian, Rochelle Bush, steward of Salem Chapel, BME Church National Historic Site, and owner and operator of Tubman Tours Canada. Please welcome me in great enthusiasm. Please join me in great enthusiasm in welcoming Rochelle. All right, Rochelle, I'm ready to hand over the virtual mic. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. So now it's time to try and share this screen. Okay. I can't do it yet. Ooh. Tell me no. Okay, I go. stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Niagara's Freedom Trail. So we're going to be discovering it as well as exploring the Freedom Trail. So Niagara's Freedom Trail opened in 1995. So it actually began in 1992. Um, and this is the brochure that came along with it. So this is the brochure that was introduced. 14 sites are identified on the brochure. And this is the map that's on the back of the brochure. So you can see how the trail goes. It's along the Niagara River um, corridor. And then it weaves into Niagara on the lake as well as St. Catharines. And this is the companion book. So the book um, was published in 1995. It identifies 30 sites. But of course, there's more information in the book. So in total, it's around 50 um, Black history sites that are included in the book. But it identifies 30. Um, I'll give you an example. So for Niagara on the Lake, for example, it mentions Fort Mississauga, but it doesn't identify Fort Mississauga in its listing in the book. Sadly, the book is out of print, so it hasn't been in print for seven years. So the author, Owen Thomas, this is what he wrote about the book. Niagara's Freedom Trail traces the journey of 19th century fugitive slaves who sought freedom and sanctuary along the tracks of the Underground Railroad, which is great, but the book incorporates three centuries of black history. But the focus of course is the Underground Railroad and the Freedom Trail, wherever you're seeing these yellow dots at the top left, that's the Lincoln and uh, Welland counties. So the top um, the yellow dots, Grantham is now St. Catherine. So you can see the current map at the bottom of uh, the Niagara region. Um, Niagara is now Niagara on the lake. Stamford and Willoughby, they were incorporated. They became Niagara Falls. And then of course, Bertie became Fort Erie. So that's what we're generally going to be looking at when we're discovering Niagara's Freedom Trail tonight. This is just a depiction of freedom seekers. And I put it in here because it's um, a nice depiction along the lake, freedom seekers uh, arriving by way of the Underground Railroad and it could be anywhere along Niagara on the, na the Niagara River corridor. So again, the Niagara's Freedom Trail began in 1995. If you see a blue bow on a picture or a slide, that means a site was added or an attraction was added um, after 1995. And then a green bow means it's a work in progress. So it's a, a site or an attraction that will be coming soon. So we're going to begin with Fort Erie because the Niagara Freedom Trail book starts with Fort Erie. And once upon a time, so in the beginning, Fort Erie was the flagship attraction. So you can see Fort Erie in the background, the Peace Bridge at the lower bottom, and then Buffalo, New York. Um, at the bottom as well. So where's my little arrow? So there's the Peace Bridge right there. There's Buffalo and of course that's Fort Erie. And you see um, uh, the Niagara River all along here. So in 1992, the first marker for Niagara's Freedom Trail was this crossing point. And again, there's Buffalo in the background where you're looking at the picture with the white car and you can see the rock over to the right-hand side. So it's the crossing. And that's on what they labeled it. 
uh, those who were instrumental in putting the Freedom Trail together. And that's because from the Buffalo side or the Black Rock side, Fort Erie was often the first view of freedom that freedom seekers or runaways or fugitives um, were able to see of Canada and at the time, British North America. The most famous figure to settle or land in Fort Erie was of course, Josiah Henson, um, the famous figure or notable individual in Uncle Tom's Cabin. So Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, world famous book in, that was published in 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin is mirrored after the life of Josiah Henson. So he landed in Fort Erie on October the 28th in 1830. So Freedom Park was dedicated in 2000. So that plaque there commemorates the thousands of freedom seekers who crossed the upper Niagara River. So from Fort Erie, Black Rock, excuse me, from Buffalo or Black Rock to Fort Erie. And then that is the park where it's located along um, the Niagara Parkway in downtown Fort Erie. Another attraction there is the Waverly Beach. Um, Waverly Beach, it was a former hotel there, the Erie Beach Hotel. So that's where the Niagara movement is. So getting back to the Freedom Seeker book or the Niagara's Freedom Trail book covering three centuries of history. So this of course was in the early 20th century, the Niagara movement. And you can see representatives, colored men from 15 states in the conference at Fort Erie, Professor Dubois, leader of the work. So Dubois is in the center picture. He's in um, the middle and he's actually looking to his right. So that's um, W.E.D. Dubois, who was a Harvard um, professor, a Harvard graduate. And he went on to form the NAACP. So the plaque at the bottom is located in Waverly Beach and it was unveiled in 2015. Now we're gonna move on to Niagara Falls. The Nathaniel Dett Memorial Chapel, which is a British Methodist Episcopal Church. So at the top, that's a picture of um, the chapel when it was showing its plank boards, I'm gonna say circa 1880. And then at the bottom is how it was looking today. If um, you were to drive past the church along Pier Street today, you would see that there, it's under restoration again and they're having a little bit of um, problems with the foundation. So a lot of the, the greenery, the shrubbery in the front and the national plaque, it has been removed temporarily. But the plaque um, was installed in 2000. Um, that's when the church was um, dedicated as a national historic site. So the church, well, I'm gonna get to that. I'll pass on that right now. And we'll discuss it with Oliver Parnell who escaped by way of the Underground Railroad. He came from Maryland, Berlin, Maryland. And he arrived in 1856 and he passed through William Still's site in Philadelphia. William Still was the station manager um, for the Vigilance Committee. And he documented a lot of fugitive slave narratives in a book titled The Underground Railroad. And it was published in the early 1870s. So Oliver Parnell crossed the Niagara River. He was destitute and broke. He did not have anything. And of course, at the time, um, the majority of people of African descent who were enslaved in the United States were forbidden to learn how to read or write. Parnell could not read or write, but he was um, an entrepreneur. Uh, he worked hard. And shortly before he passed away, the BME church was originally located on Murray Street. So it was up a hill. Oliver Parnell donated the land uh, where the church currently, currently is located, Pier and Gray Street. So he was wealthy enough to donate land to the BME congregation and the church was rolled down the hill at Murray Street to its current location. Burr Plato escaped by way of the Underground Railroad with seven other individuals. They crossed at Buffalo or Black Rock and made their way to Fort Erie. Burr Plato was also destitute and broke, um, but he understood the importance of a formal education. He worked during the day, he went to school at night, and by the early 1880s, he became an alderman of Niagara Falls. So he's a famous individual. His portrait hangs in the Niagara Falls City Hall. Then we have, um, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but Burr Plato escaped from Virginia. At the bottom, we have Dr. Robert Nathaniel Dett. His father uh, escaped from Maryland. His mother was free black and was born in Washington, DC. They settled, his parents settled in Niagara Falls. Uh, Nathaniel Dett received a formal education. Um, 
he um, taught at the Hamptons. He also had a Corel, and there's a world famous Corel now that travels around, and um, it's named after him, of course. And um, they sing; it's like a jubilee. But when Det was living, he also had a Corel, and not only did they travel around North America, they traveled around Europe as well. So Parnell and Plato are buried at the Lundy's Lane Museum, and Det is uh, buried at the Fairview Cemetery in Niagara Falls. And of course, the BME Church is named after uh, Dr. Det. Harriet Tubman interpretive panels. So they went up uh, 2017 and they are along the Niagara Parkway. So um, they're Niagara Parks Commission. So if I mention Niagara Parkway, just think in terms of Niagara Parks. So that's at the located at the Whitewater Walk near the suspension bridge. So at the top is the suspension bridge. You can see the train is crossing into Canada. And there, of course, is Niagara Falls in the background. So the Harriet Tubman interpretive panels are there because it's her only known crossing into Canada. So it's about the Joe Bailey rescue in November 1856. In December 1856, Tubman crossed with Joe Bailey, his brother William Bailey, as well as Peter Pennington, and possibly another woman by the name of Eliza Monarchy. Um, but they did cross at that location. And again, it's Tubman's only known crossing point into Canada. Prior to the opening of the suspension bridge in 1855, we don't know where she crossed. She may have crossed from Buffalo, Black Rock, Buffalo or Black Rock into Fort Erie, or she may have crossed at the lower end from Lewiston into Queenston, as well as Youngstown into uh, the Niagara-on-the-Lake area. So we do not know. An indoor attraction at Niagara Falls, of course, is the Niagara Falls History Museum. So if you want to learn more about Black history in Niagara Falls, um, you can always go to this location and they, all, they also provide um, a walking tour of Lundy's Lane. So an, I won't say an underground, a Black history walking tour of Lundy's Lane uh, Museum, excuse me, cemetery. <laughs> and I do want to mention that this museum is noted on the Freedom Seeker brochure. So the Niagara's Freedom Trail brochure. The newest attraction, the Niagara Military Museum Black History Exhibit. So it was introduced in 2020. So the exhibit starts with um, the War of 1812 Black soldiers, Richard Pierpoint being one of them. Uh, then, of course, the Civil War veterans, those who were in Canada and served for the Union Army. And then um, several Freedom Seeker descendants who fought during World War I as well as World War II. And then other individuals who served in the military, both uh, men and women. It would be, uh, yeah, I couldn't, I could never miss this upcoming one. Yeah, Wilma Morrison. So there's going to be a courtyard to her in the future. Everybody's familiar with this. Um, it'll be near the BME Church in Niagara Falls, so the R. Nathaniel Debt Chapel. And Niagara Falls, the, um, the city decided that they will recognize Wilma Morrison in several ways. So she's going to have a mural as well. Um, and it's because of all her work. Um, that she, her time and effort and what she dedicated to Black history, especially in the Niagara Falls area. So yes, that courtyard is coming soon with a mural and um, it's well-deserved. So where you see 2023 in the question mark, question mark means it should be in 2023. That may be dedicated in 2024, but that's why the question mark's there. Moving on to Queenston. So that's a picture of Brock's Monument, of course. To the right side is Lewiston and to the left side is Queenston. So Brock's Monument, which is also Brock's tombstone, the entire site is hallowed ground. So this is where the Colored Corps fought. Uh, the Colored Corps was raised by Richard Pierpoint and we're going to get um, discuss Richard Pierpoint uh, momentarily. So we'll discuss him in a little bit but the entire area is hallowed ground. Chloe Cooley is also another individual, but first we're gonna discuss Governor John Grave Simcoe. So this is um, 1793 British North American um, Act. So it's an act to prevent the further introduction of slaves and to limit the term of contracts for servitude within the province. This came about because Chloe Cooley was bound and gagged and sold to an enslaver 
and possibly in New York State. We don't know if she remained in New York State. We don't know what happened to Chloe Cooley. But the provincial marker was dedicated to her in 2007. So because of the incident that surrounds Chloe Cooley and her being sold into enslavement in the U.S., that brought about, let me see if I can back this up one, that brought about the act to prevent the further introduction of slaves um, to the and to limit the term of contracts in the province. So Chloe Cooley received um, a heritage minute this year. So it was introduced in February. So Historic Canada dedicated a commercial to Chloe Cooley because of the incident that occurred. So I don't wanna say that it was the first anti-slavery act, but it was the first act of um, legislation of its kind in the British colonies. So Chloe Cooley, we don't know when it's coming, but there was she received a designation as a person of national historic importance. So in 2023, the plaque will be erected, hopefully, and I say hopefully because we don't know, it's not on Parks Canada's webpage yet, along the Niagara Parkway. So it should be in Queenston. So fingers crossed that it will happen there and hopefully it'll happen in 2023. Also in Queenston. So where the plaque was, the colored core plaque along um, beside Brock's monument is the Black Militia Units plaque of Upper Canada. So this was dedicated in 2019 and it's a point of interest for all the soldiers who fought to defend this country. Also at Queenston Heights, um, I said um, it was hollowed ground. So Queenston Heights Park. Yeah, you can't go to the park anymore without discussing the landscape of nations and without viewing uh, the exhibit. So the million dollar exhibit. So. When the Colored Corps was fighting to defend this country during the War of 1812, they were fighting along British soldiers, alongside of British soldiers, as well as our Indigenous brothers to defend this country. So now, as for Tubman Tours Canada, when I take groups to Queenston Heights Park, we definitely go over and um, look at this exhibit. So Queenston Heights Park, for sure, without question, is a 45-minute stop. Niagara on the Lake. Negro burial ground. So right now, Negro burial ground uh, was renamed the Niagara Baptist Church burial ground. So there's going to be a new plaque coming with regards to this. Um, I don't know when it will be dedicated. I'm not certain. Um, I haven't seen any announcement for it or anything, but I definitely would like to be there in celebration of it. Uh, the only downside to the plaque, and I think it's a great thing that the plaque, that it's being renamed, the only downside is, is that the title doesn't identify people of African descent. So it's still good that it is the Niagara Baptist Church um, plaque, so it'll be identified as that. So what's happening out here right now, I'm sure everybody um, follows the news. Um, a gentleman from Toronto is doing his best to uncover um, gravestones or grave sites at uh, the cemetery there. So right now, if you were to go out there, you it's on Mississauga Avenue, you'll see that some of these grave sites are marked with uh, Canadian flags. So they're little flags and there's outlined with, um, oh, I can't think at the moment, what's it called? Graffiti artists use it, uh, spray paint. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it gets you, but that's what they're doing out there, which is a great thing. And we wish them the best with that. 2006, uh, the plaque was introduced for the William and Susanna Stewart House. So William and Susanna Stewart lived in Niagara on the Lakes Colored Village between 1834 and 1847. And that house is pretty much a tribute to them. So it's a private residence right now. Uh, the best you can do is stand outside of it, but it is not open for um, tourists. So this is one of the highlights of the Niagara on the Lake Black History walking tours. So in 2018, the Voices of Freedom Park was introduced and it is phenomenal. So it's at Regent and John Street. 
you have to download an app and it takes you anywhere between 60 to 90 minutes, depending on how fast you want to move, to walk around the neighborhood where Black people were actually living. So this is one of the best attractions that I know of in the Niagara region, just to walk around this neighborhood. So with Niagara on the Lake, of course, and I, I gave an example at the beginning, Fort Mississauga is mentioned in the book, but it's not identified. This, of course, came later. But one of the famous families in Niagara on the Lake would be the Waters family. And if you want to learn more about them, of course, you can Google them and you can always go out to St. Mark Cemetery and look at uh, the gravestones that are dedicated to members of the Waters family. St. Catharines. Richard Pierpoint. We're very familiar with him, or we should be. So he's recognized now as the most famous Black soldier in British North America, most famous Black loyalist as well. So Richard Pierpoint was born around 1744. He was a captured African. He was enslaved in 1760 was bound on a slave ship, um, crossed the transatlantic, um, was involved in the slave trade. We was captured, sold to a British officer in the American colonies. And then when the American Revolution broke out, Richard Pierpoint enlisted because the call from the British was, if you fought for the crown, you would be granted your freedom after the war. So Pierpoint did that. And when the war was over, he received 200 acres in St. Catharines. Um, when the War of 1812 broke out, Pierpoint was roughly 68 years old. But he had already had a taste of freedom. He had it from the time he was born till the time he was captured. Then he was enslaved. He had the fight during the war. And then by the time the War of 1812 breaks out, uh, he's overcome with a great deal of fear because he understands that with the American invasion, if they seized the country, he would be re-enslaved. Other Black males understood that as well. So Richard Pierpoint was about 68 years old when he enlisted in the War of 1812, and it was his idea to raise the Colored Corps, a Black militia unit. Richard Pierpoint received a Heritage Minute in uh, 2012 to commemorate the War of 1812. And again, you can go on YouTube and look at that. This year, um, we had the grand opening for the Richard Pierpoint Park. So it was actually added in 2021, St. Catherine City Council passed, um, uh, they voted unanimously to rename Centennial Gardens after Richard Pierpoint. And this year in June, 2022, we had the grand celebration. So Richard Pierpoint is a famous figure. He's a person of national importance. There is a federal building in London, Ontario named after him. There is also um, the Canadian Embassy in Senegal named after him. Um, the national plaque, so I just looked at it today. Um, I guess there was an update with Parks Canada. So the national plaque was going to go to Fergus, Ontario. Now it's indicating that it's the proposed site. Um, I'm still hopeful, fingers crossed, bring that plaque down here for Pierpoint because this is where he lived for most of his life. So he was in the Fergus area or Garifaxa area for a hot minute, just a couple of years. But for the majority of his life, he was down here in Niagara and the property, his provincial plaque is on the property where he once settled. Um, so in this park, and uh, this is why the park was renamed after him because it was part of his property. Salem Chapel, British Methodist Episcopal Church. What can I say about Salem Chapel? So um, there are a few points of entry along Niagara's Freedom Trail. So I've identified um, two already in Niagara Falls. So the Niagara Falls uh, Historical Museum, as well as the Black Military Exhibit at um, the Niagara Military Museum. Salem Chapel is also a point of entry. It is the crown jewel. The Nathaniel Debt Church is also a point of entry, but right now they're still working out um, tourism. So it's because of renovations and stuff. So they're still working, um, trying to work that out. So with the Salem Chapel, it's uh, by appointment only. 
So it was built by African-American freedom seekers, and it's the third church in the city of St. Catharines, and it was dedicated on November 4th, 1855. So the left picture shows the plank board that pictures around circa 1913, maybe 1915, and then the one to the right uh, was taken last year. So that's an image from last year, and that's pretty much how the Salem Chapel looks right now, and it's under renovation still, so it's ongoing. It's always been ongoing with Salem Chapel. So in 2000, the Salem Chapel uh, was designated um, a National Historic Site. One of the reasons for that is because it was um, because of its connection to our most famous member, Harriet Tubman, and because of the anti-slavery anti activity that took place there. So Harriet Tubman became a person of national significance in 2005. So her provincial plaque went up in 1993, and you can see her year of birth, 1820, because that's what most people assumed, 1820 or 1821. So again, that was 1993. Fast forwarding when uh, bio, newer biographies come out um, about Harriet Tubman in the 21st century, um, the idea is that, um, well, some of the information that was found, so secondary information was that she may have been born in 1822. So you'll see on... Um, the national plaque, it says circa 1822. But if you were to go inside Salem Chapel, you'll see other dates um, surrounding Harriet Tubman's year of birth. So yeah, what can I say about Harriet Tubman? I could sit here and talk to you for hours about Tubman. I'm sure you know that, as well as the Salem Chapel and uh, local Black history. But yes, there is Sister Tubman right there, very proud that she was a member of the Salem Chapel. The statue for Harriet Tubman on the church property came in in 2010. So that was done by a local artist by the name of Frank Recruit. And the quote that's on the marble stone, as you can see, says, um, I wouldn't trust Uncle Sam with my people no longer. I brought them all clear off to Canada. And that's what she said in 1868 to Sarah Bradford, who was her first biographer. You'll remember that the statue was toppled last year. So almost a year ago. Um, well, next weekend will be a year ago that the statue was toppled. So the replacement statue is in the oval shape. Uh, we have that inside the church. It was unveiled inside the church in June, and it will go up by the end of the month. So I'm proud to announce that we did receive government funding to get the fence installed. So we're going to have the fence installed this month. Um, and that came about with uh, help from the Niagara Regional Police. Um, Constable Gul Muhammad, and uh, we thank him for that because he showed us the way um, about the application and how to file for it. So that's coming up. The downside to the fencing means visitors who are out of town will not be able to walk around the church anymore. So it's disheartening. I wish there was another way to do this, but it, it's not possible because we don't operate like your normal nine to five museum. So that's the downside. So people won't be able to see the new statue. And the only reason why it hasn't been erected yet is because of uh, the vandalism that is sweeping not only St. Catharines, but other parts of the region. To the right is the Harriet Tubman statue at uh, the Harriet Tubman Public School. So that came up in 2016. And you can see that Harriet Tubman is holding a book. And that's because she was an ambassador of education. So Harriet Tubman was denied an education. So what she did is she paid um, a dollar a week for her nephew, um, James Alfred, um, to study in Philadelphia for two years. So a dollar a week for two years. He received an education. Uh, Tubman also educated another nephew, Harkless Bowley, along with um, a woman by the name, or a little girl, I should say, Margaret Stewart, who Tubman was guardian over. And after the Civil War, she put on multiple fairs in Auburn, New York, so that she could raise money so that freed Black children in South Carolina would receive an education. So she made certain that she got them chalkboards, pencils, notebooks, things of that nature. So Tubman said that her head injury prevented her from concentrating on books. So that's why she was not able to do that. Um, so that's why she was not able to read or write. So what she did in return was make certain 
that those that were near and dear to her heart received an education. So Tubman was an advocate of education, or as we like to say, an ambassador of education. And one thing about this picture too, with her holding, or the statue with her holding the book, it gives the young people there a better understanding of the importance of education. So when they're looking at Harriet Tubman, they learned that she could not read or write, but she insisted that others who were able to learn to read and write, so younger people. Zion Baptist Church. To the left-hand side, um, that is the original Zion Baptist Church. So Zion Baptist Church started as, off as a Baptist society in 1838, and by 1844, um, it opened as a church. So they actually constructed this church here, so members of the Baptist faith. The church, unfortunately, was demolished in 1958, and the congregation relocated to this little um, home that they converted into a church on Raymond Street. The most famous member of Zion Baptist Church is Reverend Anthony Burns. So Reverend Burns was enslaved in Virginia. He escaped in May 1854, made his way to Boston, and he made the mistake of acknowledging his enslaver. And he was arrested. He was sent to jail, um, taken to the Boston courthouse, and he was jailed there. And there was five days worth of rioting. So it ended up being the largest abolitionist revolt in American history. Cost the U.S. government approximately $40,000, 50,000 people lined the streets. Burns was marched to the docks of the Boston Harbor and he was returned to enslavement. From there, he was uh, sold to a North Carolina enslaver. And then his freedom was purchased by his friends from Boston. And then he um, decided to take up an offer from a Quaker woman, a white woman, and he studied theology in Ohio at Oberlin College. Then from there, he went on to Indiana. The racial restrictive codes caused him to relocate to St. Catharines, where he became pastor of Zion Baptist Church. So he was um, at the Zion Baptist Church for two short years. He passed away because he was very ill. He died of tuberculosis. Then he passed away at the age of 28. In 1964, members of the St. Catharines Lincoln Historical Society had a plaque erected in his honor, which stands at the gates of Victoria Lawn Cemetery. So there's the plaque there. Uh, and there is Reverend Anthony Burns' gravesite. So the plexiglass was um, the covering to protect the gravestone was put in place there around 2002 by Parks Canada. And then the guardian angels maintain the Burns gravesite. Victoria Lawn Cemetery. Yes. So coming next year, Salem Chapel BME Church, along with Victoria Lawn Cemetery, will introduce an Underground Railroad walking tour. Um, I'm sure some of you know are aware of this, but it will incorporate other famous individuals or well-known individuals. So right now along the Niagara's Freedom Trail, Anthony Burns at Victoria Lawn Cemetery, Victoria Lawn Cemetery is the primary focus. But along with him in his area, so if I were to take a tour group in there, just standing by the Burns' gravesite, I could point out Harriet Tubman's family members, uh, members of the Fugitive Aid Society, my relatives, members of the um, Salem Chapel um, BME Church, so the original trustees. So they're there, so it's um, going to be turned into um, an Underground Railroad walking tour. And last but not least, the St. Catharines Museum. So if you want to learn more about Black history in St. Catharines and information about um, or the history of St. Catharines as a whole, this is where you would go to learn a great deal of information. So the St. Catharines Museum is also featured on the Niagara's Freedom Trail brochure. That's it. That's a wrap. I feel that I went way too fast, and that's because I have to boohoo about it, so I will. Boo-hoo! I couldn't read my notes, and my notes would have given me more uh, information, and then I would have talked you to death. <laughs> so a special thanks to the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Centre, uh, the staff, for inviting me to talk about the Niagara's Freedom Trail. 
So if you're interested, you can always follow me on Facebook at Tubman Tours Canada. Um, I put up a lot of history content and, and I try to make it as Canadian as possible. Like meaning not as Canadian. I try to put up Canadian content. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. And I will stop sharing now. Oh, Rochelle, thank you so, so, so much. Um, I always learn so much from you. So thank you for coming on and sharing this. I love your passion, your wit, uh, and your extensive knowledge. I think it's appreciated by us all. So I uh, give me just one second to uh, to put up my my slides. Yeah, take a drink of water. <laughs> um, I just feel I can, that I missed a lot. You know what though? I I don't think. I mean, maybe, maybe we'll have to have you on for round two, but I just learned so much from all of these sites that I'm even just familiar with as, you know, working at the museum. I'm like, oh yeah, I know those sites, but everything you talked about, I learned something new. So thank you. It was incredible. I just thought of something. Yes. So, so it started off with 14 sites on the brochure, 30 in the book. But when you go through the book, you know, there's at least 50, but now with those that have been added an additional 14 plus four that are will be available soon, right? So the Wilma Morrison Cultural Hub, um, the two cemeteries, um, well, the third one's escaping me now, uh, the fourth one, I should say. And then, uh, yeah. So by the time it's all said and done, there's a good 70 attractions along Niagara's Freedom Trail. Oh, that's so incredible. And yeah. they take the work and the commitment of a whole community of people to do the work. It's grassroots work. It's incredible to see it all come together. Yes. But the, the main thing is um, the originators who developed the trail, they said they never wanted it to stop. They always wanted to see it to continue to be developed, um, which is great. So the more that's added on, the best. The only thing that I'm worried about is the Chloe Cooley plaque. That If that doesn't come up in... Queenston, man. I think I'm going to have to protest the federal government. I'm not kidding. <laughs> no. It has to. Where else could they put it? Absolutely. And she deserves <laughs> recognition. Absolutely. Oh, 100%. I, I know at the museum, we still have quite a few Niagara Freedom Trail brochures uh, that we hand out to visitors who are very eager. And anyone listening nice. in, you know, if you want to come by the museum, we do have those physical brochures with us. Do you think that they'll be able to create more brochures once it's updated? Or is that all kind of in the past now? I think that's in the past. So if they if you have a brochure, it's a keeper. It's a keepsake. Right. <laughs> if you have the book, it's a keeper. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we shouldn't tell too many people that we have those brochures at the museum. <laughs> Hang on to <laughs> as, as many as you can. <laughs> <laughs> we broadcast it on the internet <laughs> all right I'm going to share my screen and just give a little uh, a conclusion as we wait for more questions to to, to come in here uh, so let, just give me one second here as I share oh how oh here we go Okay, so once again, Rochelle, thank you so much. For anyone that does have comments, questions for Rochelle, please post them in the chat box now and I will I'll be sure to, to get to you and, and to ask Rochelle uh, for on your behalf. Uh, while we do wait for questions, just a few quick wrap up notes here. Um, again, this is what the comment, bo look, the comment box looks like if you wanna tap away. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please consider making a donation to the museum so that we can continue to deliver at the high quality programming that you come to expect from us and that we love to share with you. Uh, we really appreciate any donation you're able to make. Give us a call. We have our phone number and our website here on the screen for you. Um, the Active STC is an online option for giving donations or you can give us a call if that's easier. Uh, we'd also uh, like to remind everyone to please, please like, follow, subscribe on all of our social media channels, including right here on YouTube, as well as WordPress, our podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And um, if you enjoy our content, please share it in our networks. It really, in your networks, it really helps allow our community to grow and expand in this uh, virtual realm. 
Uh, we are so excited. Next, uh, next virtual lecture, we're having on uh, Dr. Paul Miller with a discussion and a history of the Queenston Street neighborhood. So that is October 18th, 7 p.m. Welcome you right back here on your YouTube channel uh, to, to explore the very vibrant and storied past of Queenston and kind of change our, our narratives of what this neighborhood's all about. Looking forward to that. Um, the virtual museum lecture series is of course produced by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center and the city of St. Catharines. That's it for my conclusion remarks. So let me stop uh, sharing here and let's get to questions. Let's, I'm gonna head on to our YouTube page. See what we have here. Um, Zero, of... yay! <laughs> 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 we have lots of good things to say here. We have Des saying, thank you, Rochelle. Learned a lot. Uh, Dallas267 asks, uh, where is the Burns grave site? Is it close to the plaque? No, it is not. So if you're walking in, it's in old section G. So if you're walking in, gear to the left. And then your first fork in the road on the left, take that fork. Yes. And then it's on your right hand side. Yes. So walk yes. further down on your right hand side. Old section G, you can't miss it. It has some really beautiful gardens that have oh, the caretakers yeah. have put in some beautiful gardens. I like to look for there's a big, um, a big a headstone grave. So it looks like a monument at the very end of the road. Um, and so if you look, if you go towards this big monument, it's on the right of that. So that's what I like yes. to tell people too. I don't know. <laughs> Um, we have another great question. Speaking of cemeteries from Adam Montgomery, he says, uh, thanks, Rochelle. I've never asked other than Salem Chapel for obvious reasons, your favorite. What is your favorite site on the trail? I don't know. <laughs> My favorite site on the trail. Adam, why would you do that to me? <laughs> um, I'm going to have to say Voices of Freedom Park, even though it's for self-guided um travelers so it's not you can't take um a motor coach there many of the sites you can't travel by bus there um fort erie's bad for that niagara on the lake's bad for that um voices of freedom park is one of them for sure yeah oh that's great and of course richard pierpoint park now but again you can't park the motor coach so very sad <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, fair enough thank you for sharing that uh adam gives a big smiley face to that <laughs> oh, <thanks>. <laughs> <laughs> um okay alana alana brown asks she says thanks rochelle any advice for emerging historians who are planning on specializing in black canadian history Yeah, I, you got me. <laughs> you just, um, you know what? Just stay true to the narrative, and do not start reimagining the history. That's it. That's as far as I'll go. <laughs> yeah, it's, no reimagining the history. <laughs> stay true to it. <laughs> stay true to the narrative. Stay true yes. to the sources. Yeah, yes, I like that. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. As someone who's dedicated your whole life to that to that narrative and those sources, right? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of the reimagining going on. So that's why it's like, mm, no. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, thank yeah. you for sharing that. Uh, lots of, um, you know, lots of, of good, positive thank yous and comments. So thanks, Rochelle. I know I, I had a question. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, it might be a tricky one, but when you were mentioning the burial ground plaque, uh, how they were changing the name um, from the, the Negro burial grounds to the new name for the plaque do you know what the process was to rename that provincial plaque like I imagine it would have taken years to rename it oh yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I'm I'm not sure how that came about so I cannot uh, speak to the process okay um I can say this at first I was taken aback by it because it doesn't identify anybody black but then when you really read the history, even in the, the Freedom Trail book, half that cemetery should be white folks. Mm. So I under I get it now why it's a uh, Niagara Baptist, but it would be nice to identify it. Like the text still identifies black people, 
but mm -hmm. um it identifies both black people as well as white people but mm -hmm. i don't know um that's the way it is yeah i wonder if there's some sort of politically correct you know because it's provincial government i'm not sure but interesting yeah. it was interesting to hear like i'm glad that they changed the name of the of the plaque it's too bad that it doesn't reflect the history as much as it could have uh, well, but i it does, but you have to get out and read it, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. So when driving by it now, you have to say the current name and formerly known as. Uh, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, interesting. Huh. Yeah, I thought that I thought that was uh yeah, insightful. Um thank you, Rochelle. I think uh oh, we do have one more question coming in again from Dallas267 asks. What happened to the collection that Wilma compiled? Is it housed at a particular museum? So the Norval Johnson Heritage Library went to the St. Catharines Museum. Some of the collection is still at the BME Church in Niagara Falls. Um, yeah, so that's touchy because as a BME church member, um, I can't speak a lot to it, but I want to know where it is so there's a new minister there he just started um i'm going to say about six weeks ago him and his wife so we're going to have to sit down and have some discussions because we have to work on tours and how we're going to coordinate that because of course they're the sister church but it's uh the history so as far as i know the information should still be there especially the photographs and the artifacts but if it's not i don't know what to tell you Hmm. Maybe it was handed over to the Niagara um, Falls Historical Museum. I did not get word about that because they are going to put in a permanent exhibit dedicated uh, to Wilma. So, it's, so it would be okay if it went there as long as it's not lost or in somebody's basement. That's the main thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Getting that. Or sold on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh gosh, I think my heart just dropped thinking about that. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yes, hopefully I will be able to find that information in a public institution so that we're able, we're all able to uh, to research yes. and benefit from that research. Yes. And I'm so glad to hear that Wilma will be having that sort of commemoration uh, in her honor. Like that's so beautiful. Well, and she deserves I'm it. Glad to hear that. She yeah. absolutely does. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, it looks like that's it for uh, for questions, Rochelle. Nice. Uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Well, Rochelle, as always, it was so wonderful to have you to have you on uh, the Virtual Museum Lecture Series to learn from you. Uh, and we're excited to, I know I'm personally very excited for the cemetery tours you're planning on offering in the summer. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to those and I look forward to seeing uh, what else, what else you get up to. We're always here to, to support you. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank awesome. you, sir. It was a pleasure to be invited to speak tonight. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, everyone, that's it for your future virtual museum lecture. Uh, and have a great rest of your night, everyone, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye, everyone. See you later. Bye. All right. Okay.